Well, um, welcome everybody. It's an honor to be here back in Bangkok. I haven't been here since the month before the world went into COVID lockdown. So it's nice to be back. Um, as Raphael said, I'm the Global Director of Water Weapons at IUCN, and I'm going to give a very quick, because I have literally four and a half minutes, overview of some of the issues that we're trying to tackle with. And I'm going to start with this word. That's true. That's me. Bad news. I'm going to start with bad news. And I think that's because the situation for the world's water and wetlands is not a good state. I think, as you can see on the slide behind me, we know, for example, that we are in the situation of loss in terms of a third of the world's free flowing rivers have gone. They are dammed or adjusted or blocked or manipulated in the way that we've historically thought we needed to do. That we are losing a third and have lost a third of the world's wetlands over the last 50 years. And that a third of freshwater species are threatened with extinction. So these are, if you like, the rule of three. We are losing these key important elements of freshwater biodiversity at a rate that we've never seen before. And it's due to a variety of different factors. They're not unknown to us. Actually, if there's anything that IUCN does, if there's anything that conservation at large does, is that from a water perspective, we have the technical capacity to solve these problems. We may not have the full governance capacity, we may not have the laws and regulations. As you see there, 60% of water bodies in Europe are in poor condition. And that's even despite having some of the world's most strictest regulations. But we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we have the tactics, but we don't apply them. And we don't apply them very well because water is the ultimate trade-off. It's something that our economies use intrinsically in everything that we do. And because we don't see it in everything we do, we don't value it as we do other things. It's in our food, it's in our clothing, it's in the ability to power our lights, it's in our building materials, it's in our fuels. It's a feedstock or a fuel into every part of our economy. As a consequence of that, we don't deal with it adequately enough. And when we do, from a conservation perspective, we don't think ambitiously enough. We don't think about scalability. We don't think about replication. We think very much about pilots and sites and approaches which are incredibly, incredibly valuable, but which are affected deeply by the fact that water flows as a resource through our habitats and through our landscapes. And we struggle to be able to deal with the fact that it moves and that it's a fluid and that it suffers from pollution just as much as it, follow, as it suffers from uh, overuse um, and adjustments in its flow. And yesterday in the program discussion, uh, if you recall when the blue dots were all appearing on the screen and we saw all the topics that people were interested in and they thought were important, climate change was number one, agricultural land was number two, and I think water was number three if I recall. But actually I would bet that in the climate bubble and in the agriculture and land bubble, water is part of those two topics predominantly. Floods and droughts, overuse, underuse, water scarcity, water security issues. So I think it's worthwhile trying to understand that we're trying to deal with a very complex topic that from a pure conservation perspective is that dealing with it only from a conservation angle is going to get us, and has got us today, limited results. And that's the reality that we face, is that, is that since the 1970s, there's been an 83% decline in the freshwater biodiversity. And so we're trying to shift these huge tasks in a, in a way that is very, very challenging. Um, three, uh, last week there was a new report out on uh, Sustainable Development Goal 6, SDG 6, which pointed out that actually all of the targets are off track, uh, as they are across all of the SDGs. And so I think it's worth our reflecting on that in terms of this is also a call to action, but it's also an opportunity for IOCN to rally its members <coughs> and to upskill in this area, to upscale our work, to upscale our ambition, and to upskill on these issues uh, quickly, rapidly. We are losing time. We're trying to focus on the role of government, of investors, 
to make better decisions around water. And that requires giving them the right type of information, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to ensure that we harness the true full potential of IOCN. I've been in IOCN for 15 years. It's got so much potential, its membership and its network, so much potential, but we need to harness the data, the learning, the standards, the work in a way that applies across scales and can be scaled in different contexts rather than piecemeal one by one. And we must, as a union, upskill on some of these tools and tactics to be able to make sure that we have the impact that we need. And one initiative that I want to just 30 seconds talk about is the Freshwater Challenge. Now, some of you may have heard about this. It is a country-led uh, initiative. That means it's got it's actually got 46 countries and the European Union, which is the European Union, which has joined up to this. And this is an initiative around two clear goals. Rather than getting very complicated into numerous KPIs and numerous indicators, two clear goals. Restore 300,000 kilometers of rivers around the world. And restore 350 million hectares of wetlands. Very, very simple. Not easy to do, but if you spread that volume, that area across the planet, it's, it's doable, it's achievable by 2030. Right now, this is something that's been driven by ourselves, with our members, WF, Wetlands International, TNC and others, uh, Conservation International, but also with uh, the United Nations Environment Programme and the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, to really drive action with states, to really drive the change that we want to see, to accelerate implementation of restoration of freshwater ecosystems. Rather than just saying restoration, landscapes, specifically what on freshwater is happening and how are you doing it and are you seeing the impact that you want to see in freshwater systems rather than assuming there is impact <coughs> to elevate and integrate restoration into national strategies into NBCEPs, into NDCs, into LDN land declaration neutrality targets across the Rio conventions so putting it much more firmly into national planning strategies and quantifying exactly what those ambitions look like in practice. So how are people delivering these results? And what do they look like so that countries can learn from each other over the next seven, six, seven years what's an aim to achieve these two targets? And there is some amazing work already going on. It's just no one's ever asked countries what they're doing specifically on restoring the freshwater ecosystems. They've asked them about restoration, but not specifically on freshwater. So we're trying to fill some knowledge gaps, we're trying to improve some capacity, we're trying to encourage stakeholders to share lessons across boundaries, across sectoral boundaries and across national boundaries, to bring that sharing capacity to the table and upskill conservation on freshwater and freshwater biodiversity. So you'll see here, this is the membership, this is my last slide, very, very briefly. The membership is broad across the world. We've got more countries signing up to it now um, than we possibly can cope with. The main challenge, actually, if I'm completely honest, is Asia. Asia, we have three countries out of the 46. There's now probably in the 50s in the next couple of months. Three countries. And I think this is an opportunity for Asian members of IOCN to, to um, think a little bit about what can be done how can we encourage Asian countries to commit and, and sign up to the challenge? And I'm happy over the course of the next two days to, to talk to you all further about what the challenge is, how to engage with it, what can members offer, and how can we mobilize more actors to support the challenge? Right now, there's a lot of activities going on in it, so I'm happy to share those with you all. Now, I will stop talking. I'll come back to you at the end of the session, but I'll hand it back over to Raphael. Thank you.